Morning. Uh, my name's Nick. I'm from uh, Multiplex. Um, we're we're based out. Uh, my head office is based out of London. Um, as Tony and, and uh, Steve, give you just a couple of slides to give you a little bit of an overview of who we are as a company for those that in the room that may or may not know who we are. So, Multiplex is a global construction company. Um, we've been operating for over 50 years now. Uh, predominantly, uh, initially based out of Australia. Uh, we now. I work across four different regions. Um, our UK base is out of Liverpool Street in London. Um, we have now up to over 900 personnel in our UK and <coughs> Europe division. Uh, to give you a flavour of uh, some of the live projects that we're currently working on at the moment, uh, we're very much in the UK, Europe, quite a lot around uh, London centric and uh, Scotland. Um, we work on very sort of prestigious, uh, very complex and uh, high profile uh, projects uh, over in the UK. Uh, to give you a feel, some of the ones that are up here on the screen. At the moment we have um, 22 Bishop's Gate, which will be the second tallest tower in the centre of London, 10 metres short of the Shard, 60 storeys high, uh, um, in, a, in an excess value of over 500 million, um, just that one particular job. Um, we're working on uh, Edinburgh Hospital, um, the Sick Children's Hospital uh, up there at the moment. Um, and we've won the first phase on the big Chinese development um, right by City Airport in London, um, which is a whole regeneration uh, of different businesses and buildings that are going to be built for, to cater for the, sort of the Chinese market. Um, we've also got a lot of other prestigious projects around uh, other well-known places in, in London as well, such as Oxford Street and uh, Leicester Square. Um, and around the Bishop's Gate area uh, of, of the City of London, we have a, a number of projects. In terms of our sort of BIM journey, we were doing pockets of BIM as way far back as uh, 2011, uh, but things really escalated as a, as a business in terms of uh, BIM over the last sort of th uh, three to four years. Moving on, so what we're going to talk about today is a bit of a case study on one of our projects. Uh, this is London Wall Place. Uh, this project is located at Stone's Throw from um, the main sort of iconic uh, buildings that you see in London in terms of the Gherkin. It's literally a couple of minutes walk. Um, this, this project is um, sandwiched between Moorgate and, and the Barbican. A couple of key facts on the... Has that moved? Sorry. A couple of key facts on the, on the project. Um, it consists of two buildings, uh, one 300 uh, feet square, square metres, uh, that's a shell and core. Um, that's actually already been uh, uh, taken over by Schroders now as their new uh, headquarters, or will be. Um, and the second building is a Cate fit out um, and tenants yet to be confirmed on that particular project. It's a, a joint venture with one of our sister companies, Brookfield and Oxford Properties, um, expected to complete um, middle of next year. Um, and in a value of uh, excess of £220 million pounds, that particular job. Now, what, what do we deliver with, you know, what was our sort of objectives for BIM on this project? What was the, the main aspects that we wanted to get, get out of the, the London Wall Place projects? Well, we felt, you know, this, what we got out of this project and what we really, what the enhancements that we wanted was to de-risk the design uh, and the programme. Um, the key, the key and fundamentals to this being a success was the collaboration with our supply chain. Uh, we don't have anything in-house, we don't do any design in-house, you know, we are reliant on our supply chain um, as a sort of main tier one contractor. Um, and, and a key aspect that we, we kind of got out of the project was digitalising our processes uh, from both out on site and also what we handed back to the client. So, so some key things that we kind of took from the project and something that's maybe worth bearing in mind going forward and any projects you guys are involved in uh, over here or, or over in the UK is uh, key to making BIM a success is ensuring that firstly you allocate BIM in your preliminaries when you're especially in a, the tender and a bid stage. Um, and that can sit obviously a variety of different aspects but a, a key and fundamental to the success of BIM on the job is ensuring that, you've, that the contractor or there is some dedicated as a BIM lead um, on, the, on that particular, on any particular project. Something that we included on this particular project and what we're doing going forward on lots of our other projects is uh, partnering up with, uh, with Zootech on this, on this particular project and, as I say, other projects we've got. Um, and what we fundamentally have done with them is making sure that we're digitalising all our r &Ms, our on-site procedures and some of the other uh, good functionalities that Zootech can bring to the table. Um, 
obviously key to any of the success of any BIM project is making sure that you have an execution plan. You know, we have our own standard execution plan, but I would say on every project, it's a very much a collaborative process that once once appointed and once consultants innovate across, we will sit down and have a workshop with them consultants on board to make sure that everyone's agreed about what the deliverables are and the expectations from all. Um, another very key aspect is ensuring that BIM is included in all contracts, whether that's innovation agreements with consultants or, um, as we call it in um, our business, contractual requirements with our subcontractors as well. That doesn't have to be uh, anything too over uh, yeah, detailed, but it's basically referring to that the execution plan is the overall key that everyone needs to align to in terms of the deliverables. On this particular project, um, I mean, if you used to class what they call level two BIM in, you know, in, in, the, in the UK, you could say that well, this wasn't a level two BIM because the client actually didn't produce an employee's information requirement on this job. Um, but there was uh, a, real, a real appetite from the client to go down this journey. This, this project was kind of conceived back in sort of 2011, 2012, when we came on board the end of 2013. So we kind of defined what the deliverables were going to be for BIM on this job in conjunction with them. And other aspects were kind of borne out as the, as the project progressed. Um, and as we've, I thought we've already touched on, you know, key to any success on any project, and especially a BIM project, is buy-in from your supply chain. Um, the, the slide behind me uh, demonstrates kind of 70% of the overall contract value on this particular job. Um, so, you know, some of, the, some of these supply chain partners, it was their first foray into uh, a full collaborative uh, BIM-enabled project. Um, so it was a learning curve. Um, which you know we learn aspects and they learn aspects, but by going forward working together, what it enables is that there's lots of other repeat business that we have with the supply chain that you know we shouldn't have the obstacles and the, the the necessary kind of issues that might we may have encountered during this project on the next and various other projects that we've we've taken with the with these partners. So, in very simplistic views, what what kind of aspects have been you know did did we kind of entail on the project and. Uh, Obviously, as everyone knows, class detection is a, that's a key part and that's a, you know, a real fundamental part of, of the project. But that's not just people creating models and just running, running the models through a bit of software. It's making sure you've got a standard process. So we would have fortnightly workshops and that would initially would start with the consultants when we first come on board on the project. And as and when work packages were appointed, as soon as they were on board, they were brought into these sessions and kind of echoing what Tony was saying earlier um, about, you know, do, looking at the information and reviewing the design before anything even happens on the site or goes into fabrication um, in, in the factories. Um, 4D, so 4D linking the program with the 3D model was another aspect that we utilised. And then, as I say, partnering up, um, uh, we wanted to look for a central repository for the project where we could manage all the data. Um, and that's where we, we, you know, we worked with Zootech, who we had had worked in the past on, on a, few, a few other projects. Um, and we also utilised laser scan servers as well, some of the um, as-built conditions at certain stages during the, the project's duration. So just to give you an idea, I mean, I know you, people always show 3D class detection models, but for the, the layman and the most people that are on site, still drawings are still uh, the kind of the language that people talk. So I, I like this slide just to kind of really show that by having that 3D model process, the, inf the outputs that we got from the 3D models that went into the drawings, you can see here that if we hadn't been doing that kind of collaborative workshops, the, the, the type of design that we got at uh, sort of stage E, and after we've gone through that 3D coordination process, you can see the, the, the numerous kind of builder's work holes and penetrations that were needed in the core, which if we hadn't gone through the, the boom process as it were, these would have been have to be done on site, which ends up being a very, very costly process, uh, you know, to us and everyone, you know, and obviously a time delays on the actual project. So, it, again, it's looking at that environment before anything has happened on site and actually getting everyone around a table and actually have much more clarity on what's going on. As I mentioned earlier, we also utilised um, the, the, the 4D aspect. So. Um, Again, what's already been mentioned this morning is having that kind of scope and clarity around what works are happening, how we're actually going to physically do that, and, that, and again, getting the right people to see that information uh, much more clearer instead of looking at GAN charts and, and the usual traditional methods that you know, we've been used for so long. 
And then another aspect that we utilised quite a bit on, on the project was um, the acquisition and procurement of um, hard, um, smart board to touch screen technology. Um, we, we purchased quite about three in, in total in the end by, uh, during the project duration. Um, we mounted these actually on mountable trolleys so we could move the whole unit to anywhere or in the site office so it could be utilised by not just our, our team but the consultant team or the subcontractors are on board. Plus it as you all well know, most of the guys inside don't normally get the best hardware, uh, and, and sometimes you know they can't view the information. So this was a really good kind of tool for everyone to utilise. What, what we also utilised with this project, obviously, we could look at the 3D model. We can instantly, with the, the pens, mark up on the screen the information. Uh, by the end of the meeting, you could email out all that information that's been recorded on the screen. Uh, so people that weren't present in the meeting as well, you've got a kind of record and stamp of what's been said and what's been gone on. Um, and this was used obviously not just for 3D models, but this was used for looking at standard drawings, you know, because the, the vector zooming in, you could get right in, look at dimensions and, and the like. Um, and we're now actually utilising this kind of technology on, on lots of our project sites and actually take, looking to take it a step further now. We've integrated it with uh, video conferencing so we can have uh, interactive sessions with uh, subcontractors or, or other organisations that are not based on site. And that fuzz reducing down the cost of people might be travelling if you've got a supplier in another country or on all that kind of aspect. Um, we then we then also utilise the um, so this is a video of the actual smart board, but what we actually also bought was a thing called iStar, which was a, a four-way digital camera on a tripod that we've been using out on site for aspects such as tracking progress. Um, explaining works that need to be undertaken, maybe for health and safety toolbox talks. Um, and that information then we could then upload that was recorded on site onto the smart board and we could have interactive sessions about, um, you know, I mean, that's just a, a fake, fake uh, uh, example there, but you can see where you could use the technology and the hardware uh, for, for whatever, they, you know, it could be when you've got uh, someone come on board onto the site, you can explain the site conditions and all these kind of aspects. Um, we also tr uh, trialled um, laser scanning, but we, look, we worked with a, a third party surveyor to actually look at taking that a little bit further than just uh, what they call st standard point clouds. Um, we used this as a kind of bit of a test on a couple of floors as sort of verification before the, 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 uh, the, um, the tenant trailers were going to come in just to kind of uh, reconfirm sort of tolerances uh, of, how, of what was being installed on site. Um, but working with a third party surveying company, we also looked at utilising photogrammetry. So they took the iStar digital camera, uh, stitching that with the, the laser scanning point cloud. And, and then we looked at also overlaying then the 3D model. So you had three forms of information where you could switch on and off, whether that be what's actually on site, what was actually being designed to go on site. Um, and obviously linking up with say, the photogrammetry so you've got a kind of look and feel. And then moving on, and, one, and probably the key aspect of this project and why this become a little bit of a trailblazer for us as an organisation was the key was the data deliverables. Um, so we use all the very good aspects of BIM in terms of 3D coordination and, um, and, and 4D, but one of the key things, and this wasn't a requirement from the client, this was something that we took upon ourselves, and hence why we had, uh, learnt quite a few lessons as well by going through this process with the project. But working with Zootech, you know, we looked at digitalising on-site procedures, um, we also looked at actually progress monitoring, so tracking tracking products from when they left they left the manufacturer to when they got to site, um, and then being able to instantly kind of get a status of what's been installed and and, and the like forth, um, and then obviously at the end having a sort of a digitalised handover, but that not just a standard O and M PDF format, but actually raw data, um, and actually that could be linked to other aspects within the the system and creating things like uh, PPM schedules and and extracting information from 3D models to, to form the basis of our asset registers as well. So I'm going to hand you across to Brenda now, who's going to dive into a live demonstration. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Uh, hi, everyone. Brendan O'Reilly is my name from Zootech. Um, we're working with Multiplex on a variety of projects, but the London Wall project is the, the as Nick said, the trailblazer for them. Um, and I'm going to go through a few different aspects of, of what we've done there. Particularly, I'm going to concentrate on su supplier, one particular supplier who we utilise the information they, they produced during manufacturing and, and production of the, the facade, and then how we 
use that to get into the, the progress monitoring and the management of the, the installation of that. So I'll give a quick overview first. Um, and what, what Zootech do is basically we manage data, whether it's O&M data, whether it's drawings, whether it's snagging, quality, environmental progress, it, it doesn't really matter to us. We manage data through, through our main cloud database system, but we have, you can put information directly into that. We have an app on site for collecting information on site quality, snagging progress, and then we have a 3D tool for outputting that, and in the next week or two for actually inputting information as well. So that 3D tool is gonna to be a, a two-way a, a, a two -way data repository. It's not just gonna be an output, it's gonna be an input as well. Um, on London Wall, you can see we have a, just a very simple folder structure set up, but I have the different buildings here, and this is just on the O&M side of what they're gonna get handed over. And I'm just gonna look in the, the piling, since we, Tony was talking about that. So one of the things that we've always found on projects with operation maintenance is that although there's no operation maintenance to a, to a pile, you're not gonna go down and, and clean it or test it or anything, you still need details of it if you're gonna do any reworks within the building, etc. But those guys are the first off site, it's hard to get information back. So just a very quick example, what we have here and we would have had before they got off site as well, is all of their pile integrity tests. You can see when they uploaded it, all the information, every pile integrity test is there. There are built drawings. I have a, a scroll to the right, Revit file, IFC files, DWGs and PDFs. So all that information is in early on, and it goes with all the other trades as well. So you can see I have it broken into structural, architectural, so all my architectural practices are in there and my m and &E as well. And everyone, each contractor loads the information in, we give them a template, they're shown what they have to do, they're given uh, something that Stephen spoke about was the, the, uh, the need for FM systems, they're different. So for example, on Edinburgh Hospital, another job we're doing, multiplex, they're using Maximo. So they have a Kobe output, so we have to do a Kobe output of that information, but Maximo, the asset register, requires 120 headings, because that's what Maximo requires. So we're doing it twice. But because we've thought of this at the end, we bring it back, we, you know, we thought at the end point, what do they require at the end? So at the very beginning, when we're just setting up on site, we build a structure and we go to the subcontractor and say, this is the requirement. You have to fill in these blank spaces. Basically, that's what they're doing. And with the onset of BIM, there's a lot of, um, it, it's easier to do. Like if you take the first IFC, um, information, uh, IFC files we got were the design information and we pulled equipment schedules out of them. So I have, and these, I'm gonna see the, uh, the ceiling void schedule. So there's, all of this information came out of the, the models. It wasn't exactly IFC data, we just adjusted it to the headings we required, the unit ref, and we just changed the name. So we took, we could data map, from IFC into Excel, and then I could choose what, what column from the IFC file, I want to go into what column in, in my database. So we can map that data across. So we're not stuck to COBE or IFC. You know, we, we have a whole load of different, um, different information. For example, the internal doors. What we got out of the model, we have, we, we've added a few things like the drawing ref, but we have the vision panels, smoke seals, the fire ratings, the structural opening, the door, if it has access control. You know, so you've got all that information pulling out of the model. So that's from the design. So now that's available to the subcontractors. So when they're building up their asset registers, we have something to check against. Um, we found on a job in Mumbai, I think there was about 15,000 doors or something on the project, it's a huge project. It was 5% of them were missing on the, from the procure, procurement schedule from the subcontractor. And it was only when we mapped the data against the design, we found that they were missing. So all, they'd forgotten to order all the basement doors. That was basically the, the problem. But it was quickly realized, and it was, it was sorted out on the job, just through having that data coming out of the model. Um, the bit that's really I'm here to talk about today is this, this on-site part and the facade installation. So the facade supplier, Purpose Delisa, they gave us their models and they agreed with Multiplex to barcode every single piece of glazing as a, you know, off-site. And they referenced that barcode in the model. So the first thing we pulled out of the model was our facade schedule. So I have 
um, a planned installation date. Again, we had that from a separate schedule, which we mapped to the data for the model. The last master, which is a type, the description, and the building address. The building address, if you read it, makes sense. B2 is building two, E is east elevation, L16 is level 16, and it's panel 17. So they just start on the, the elevation on the whichever side, and they, they count across. So once we had that information, that full schedule of the facade, and knew they were all barcoded, we could create a facade insulation inspection table. So I can see there's 911 out of 4,700 are now installed. So what we do is, and this happens on an iPad on site, which I can't show you here, but the guys go on site, they'll click new record on the iPad, it'll bring up this form. They scan the barcode and it will tell them what, you know, it'll fill in some of this, this data. For example, the plan insulation data, the panel address, elevation. They check it's in the right place and they set it to installed. And they have various different checks they do. So they go down through the form and they click off the alignment, pass, fail, NA. They lay three checks. So there's, well, four is the, first that it's in, it's in the right place. They have a first inspection, second inspection, final inspection. If it passes all on the first, they call it the final. But what that does, you know, every single check is done through this. And again, on their iPad or their iPhone or Android tablet. I have, very simply, a list of all of these installed. I can see the install date and time against the, the plan installation date. And because of that information, we got it from a model, I have the, the panel address is basically the UID. It's not a GUID, it's the unique identifier for this project. Obviously, the, that could be on another project. But we have a base model which they gave us, which is just the panels. There's no detail, nothing in it, just the panels. There's no structure or anything like that. So obviously, every panel is in there. This is linked to our database. <coughs> So in my database here, I have filters such as the first inspection or now a look at in, install not inspected. I can filter that down to all of them. I can see there's 100 are installed not inspected this week, sorry, or this month. That filter comes across to here, install not inspected and they show as red. So I can get a very quick visualization of what's done and what's not done. I can, because we have times on them as well, I can also click this bottom one, I'm not sure if you can read it. It says uh, installed and inspected last month and click that. So there's the ones that went in last month. So because it's time um, and, and the unit, I can, it's not just it's in, I can look at when it's in. I can also look ahead at what's due to be installed, so I can look against program because we have the expected installation date. That also gives me, um, if I click on the facade track and report, it downloads an Excel file, which I have here, and every time you just save it on your desktop, every time you open it, it reads data from the database and gives me that, and I can see the ones here, the installed actual, it's late, the ones that are green are early. So I'm getting an Excel report as well, and as I say, every time you open it, it updates, it pulls in that information from the database. We could do graphic reports on that as well, such as the numbers installed. So we could see this 3% are installed and inspected on London Wall 1, London Wall 2. So we have that kind of information again out in Excel because all we're doing is gathering data. Excel is an amazing tool. The fact that you can have URL links and pull in data makes it, a, you know, from our point of view, a very good tool as well. Um, it's not just on the facade that they, they use the, the on-site app, but that's one of the, like BIM is central to that. It would have been very difficult to do that without the BIM model because it's validated. I pull out the data from a BIM model. I know I've got every single unit. I've got the barcodes, they match up and I can see it. And because of the, the, the naming convention, just the, the levels and everything, it's quite easy to check they're in the right place. So we just, they gave us a model, we converted to IFC, pulled the, pulled the model into our, our software so you can view it, took the IFC data out, and then we created the form so we could check against. So it's literally as simple as the guys on site with their iPhone, scan the barcode, installed, then they do their checks, and, and it comes up and I'm getting a visualization of that within the model. They also use us for all of their snagging. So my various different 
the different, different buildings. They do this on site again. And what they do is they put in a series drop down. So what level am I on? I'm on level 10. It gives me the list of rooms, area four. What's the task type? Clean up notice, damaged, incomplete works, etc. cetera. Um, I'll call it a snag. They've got all the different packages. So whoever that is, when I hit the packages, it's gonna give me the, the subcontractors. And if there's any issue, that depends on the, the, the work package. Target completion date, we can set that automatically that if it's a certain package, there's a target completion date of three days or a week, it's a clean up notice, target completion is that day. And if it's not done that day, Multiplex will do the clean up and they'll back charge to the subcontractor. So it gives them really strong information. That data allows them to get to the contractors with real information, real data, and real time snagging and such. Um, and what they do, these different tables, the database is read every, you can do it down to the hour or day or week, and it will send out, so when, when one of the uh, subcontractors logs into this, they see their view, they only see their snags. But we have it set up that every day, it, it reads the database and it sends an email with their outstanding snags. We can do that down to an hourly basis. We kind of feel that if you're getting an email every time there's one put in, you're gonna ignore them, so we punch them together in an hour. Um, and also, we can set it up that if there's nothing there, it emails and said, you have no snags, which is positive as well. It's a bit of positive reinforcement, you know, so they know they're happy enough. They also use the same system for the site diary. One of the things I didn't mention, the task management there, we can drop pins on drawings, etc. cetera. Um, and one of the things I mentioned at the very beginning, within the next week, we'll be able to open a BIM model and attach snags to an IFC space or an object and it will open our, our app and you'll be able to input information directly to the database. From there you can create reports and things like that. Um, they use it every day for their site diaries. So each different package manager, you know, logged by Cole, Paul Corbett, Mike Pring, Paul Crichton, Paul Crichton there, he's putting in a lot of information. Uh, Mike Pring, they put in this, the building, the time, um, who it's, what the weather is, what contractor they're talking about, the, um, if I scroll to the top, they have labor notes, progress notes, and again, they can just filter that down to the particular contractor. So come variation time, they can look at all the notes they have about that contractor. Particularly when it comes to um, concrete, anything that's temperature based, they can't, you know, the, the weather is an effect for, for work. They can look back and go, okay, you lost five days because the temperature was below three degrees. <clears throat> what we'll do on the project is we can pull in the Met Office in the UK. You can just pull all that data in for a particular area from Excel and we can input and they can actually get the actual weather data. The reason they have the weather notes is anyone who's been in London and walked alongside the Shard or the Cheese Grater, it's windy. It's not windy anywhere else. It's just windy there. So the tall buildings create their own weather systems. So that's why they allow for the weather notes. Um, we have things like environmental inspection checklist. So again, it's another form. They go in and they fill in a general environmental checklist. So they have environmental officers who will go site to site and do audits. This is gonna be extended to um, NCRs, all sorts of auditing, notifications of defects, handover acceptance, one of the things we're talking about, Nick showed you the, uh, the iStar camera, the 3D, that when they're handing over an area, there's a 3D photo taken. It's a super high, I don't know how many megapixels, but it's a lot. Panoramic. Well, it's panoramic, yeah. It's, there's only one spot at the bottom where the, the actual stick is, but everything else you can see and you can go around. So when they're handing over from trade to trade, there's a form used on the iPad, they sign it, accept it, the photo is taken, and that forevermore is a, is a record of what it was when, you, when it was handed over. So it takes the, the, the guesswork out of it for some of the, uh, some of the various contractors. Um, we'll go into, you know, we have various different things we've done there. The idea of what we're trying to do with the London Wall project is that we're trying to do anything. Whatever data they have, whatever model or anything, we'll, we'll give it a go. We're using it as a, as a test bed for the multiplex company. Um, the facade installation is very positive. 
to go out and they got you know the supplier bought in again this is something that's been a recurring theme the supply chain buying into this and it is they had the model they'd done it okay the barcoding was etra but i know you can buy 100 barcodes for 37 pounds printed so it's a case of pulling them on and linking that to the model and whatever their, their naming convention is so that buy-in from the supply chain allows you to have strong information for your project managers these kind of projects the project managers the package managers they don't get to sit on site they don't know you know who's fitting the ductwork down in the basement they're too big so they have to rely on this kind of information the 4d bim is part of it you know that's the, the your your progress uh, intended progress but to get back to a simple 3d and that works with, on the 22 bishop's gate which nick was saying would be the second tallest tower in london we're doing that on the steelwork as well so they're going to put a, a qr code or barcode on all the steelwork and we'll do the ins manage the installation that way and again they'll be able to open up a just a model of just a steelwork and it'll color code it you can email screenshots of this you can set up automatic reports to see where you are all that kind of information but really the crux of this is and forget about zootech it's just that gathering data rather than documents is the key to this there's no point having a list of the facade schedule on a pdf it's useless you still got to sit down with a highlighter and go installed 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 go back to the drawing highlight 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 if you have that in data which bim is giving us that's making a difference and um, it'll be the same for internal fit outs we do room completion it's the same idea that we have that in data that we can use it so the buy-in and the supply chain is the main thing um, i've probably gone on enough and i've shown you enough of that nick will finish out his uh, his part now just to, just to add to what brendan has been saying, I mean, one of the, the key aspects that we, we wanted with Zootech as well is that a lot of the clients don't know what facilities management system they're going to use, and that sometimes comes very late in the day as well. So we're kind of sort of trying to future-proof ourselves as a company that we have all the information, and then we can export it out in its simplest form, XML or, or whatever we need to, you know, Kobe, whatever we need to export it out into, to, to, or align the information with some clients. We know, like, for instance, like Edinburgh Hospital, we know it's Maximo they're using, but probably two thirds of our clients, they haven't even made that decision on what facilities management system they're gonna, they're gonna utilize yet. So you know, it puts us in a strong position that we can then, if they ask us late in the day or whatever it may be, we've got that unique position where we can say, right, well, we've got your data, you know, let's work with your FM provider to make sure that it all kind of links in, links in together. So just to sort of conclude really, um, we've done a bit of a lessons learned with some of the consultants uh, across this particular project. Um, and obviously some, some of the key aspects that were sort of bore out of that, uh, that's an, all the design consultants agreed that we needed to uh, embark on BIM a lot earlier, especially uh, at, at the very least from stage C design onwards. Um, it's clear as well, and it's a, it's a running theme you'll probably hear in many kind of BIM presentations, that you need clear requirements um, and the response to be set out by the client. Now. We're probably two thirds of our clients are private sector. So the amount of EERs that we get will differ from one client to the next, or in some cases, there'll be no employee information requirement at all. So it's sitting down as soon as you're on the project and defining you know, the practical approach, what we're gonna deliver on the job um, and how we're gonna do that. Um, and then obviously, as we've already gone through today, is setting out the protocols and then, and then standards to do that. Uh, a key aspect which, which I touched on earlier was obviously key is making sure that you know BIM is deliverable in, in, the, in the contracts. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and I would say making sure when you have these workshops on a project that you have the right appropriate member of staff. You, you shouldn't just be, oh, I'm just going to send the BIM technician to the BIM, to the BIM workshops. You need to have the, the key decision makers in, in that room as well uh, because there will be issues that we've brought up on the screen and you need the right people to say, yeah, okay, you know, we can do that or we can't do that. You need to have them right people around the table. So it's fundamental that we, the process that we use is that we always make sure as well that although we've got our BIM leads, uh, when we have these workshops, that there is like the design managers or whoever, you know, makes the design decisions from both consultant and subcontractor side um, in the present or in the room. 
So that could be a bolt onto an existing design team meeting that's arranged on a fortnightly basis, or whatever suits you know suits suits the kind of the project really. Um, and and then just sitting down with both consultants and subcontractors and ensuring there's no scope gaps and uh, defining uh, uh, aspects like the model production delivery table and who's responsible for doing what at what stage. Um, so there's kind of clear direction and there's no ambiguity uh, as the project progresses as well. Um, so what have we taken out of this project, um, which we're kind of pushing across the, the rest of our projects? Well, as, as we've touched on, this become the sort of foundation for improving our own internal BIM standards uh, and our sort of best practices. Um, we obviously looked at adopting new technologies which we utilised on this project and are now sort of running across other projects in our portfolio. Um, and a key thing that we've kind of brought in is, especially even during the tenders, if we are supplied 3D models during the tender process, we will run our own due diligence, whether it's a requirement or not from the, uh, the client, and then and submit that as part of our tender process. So we will run an audit report as if we were running a class detection workshop. Um, that obviously is beneficial for our team because it sometimes can bring up quite uh, fundamental uh, design issues. That, um, yeah, and it also sort of highlights that sometimes the, a lot of the consultants up until the contractors come aboard, are all still working in silo. They're, they're, not, they're not liaising one another. So um, we've found uh, some fundamentally uh, big issues on a few of the jobs. To give you an example, we had a, a project where um, we had the service core going all the way up through the building. By doing this before we even, just during the tender process, this process of auditing the 3D models, we found quite a few issues, and this was one of them. We checked the drawings to make sure that the drawings were derived from the 3D model so they couldn't come back and say, well, the model was done out of sync with the drawings and the drawings showed the same issues and then when we won the particular job we didn't have to have that battle because we said we highlighted to you this, this, this fundamental issue during the tender process um, and that actually ended up taking six months to actually get rectified but it wasn't a cost that we bore as a contractor that was pushed back onto the client because it was you know their issue with the design team and they were meant to be supplying us a robust stagey design and just to conclude, so through this project and many other projects that we're doing BIM on uh, in multiplex, um, we also went through the, the British standards um, certification for um, capability to deliver uh, BIM to level two um, audit process of all our internal standards. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be successful and received that award and are only a kind of small number now in the UK that um, have this certification for our internal policies. And just finally to finish on, uh, we submitted this project actually this year in uh, a couple of awards, uh, one of which was the Construction Excellence Award. Um, we made a shortlist, unfortunately we didn't win on this particular, <laughs> particular occasion, but um, it, was, it was a good nod to um, not just the Multiplex team, but all the supply chain that worked with us uh, on this particular project as well. Um, so just to recap, you know, what, we, what we took and what this project sort of set the standard was obviously de-risking the design of the programme, uh, our collaboration fundamentally with the, with the supply chain, uh, new technologies, and as Brendan's already gone through and what we've discussed today, is digitalising the both on-site and our handover process. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you.